everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. It is Monday, July 20th, and we are here um, with another beautiful day at our fingertips with another opportunity to serve the Lord, and we are blessed uh, to be able to open His Word together this morning, to undertake uh, the knowledge of God for our lives and to try to apply it to the best of our abilities. As we get started this morning, I just want to challenge us to pray, uh, as we do for most Mondays, just, just pray for our governments. Pray for the uh, the leadership and direction that our governments are taking our nation. Um, pray, pray for their hearts. Pray that they would come to know Jesus Christ. Pray that the church would be bold uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and praying for our leaders that they would write and even encourage them with scripture. Um, just pray uh, that our leaders uh, would allow us as Christians to live quiet and peaceable lives as we're commanded to from the scripture. So pray for our governments. Pray for um, all that they uh, are in the midst of for wisdom and discernment and also for what is right according to God. So this morning we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I actually came across this passage while I was studying on wisdom. And as I was thinking about this passage, I just thought, how, how encouraging is this for us as believers? Because oftentimes in our lives, we can become very discouraged at sometimes the lack of response that people have to the truth of God. It can be very discouraging to preach the gospel, to invite people to church, to invite people to come to Bible study, or even to, to try to share with loved ones and family members and friends the truth of God's word because you love and care about them. And yet the response is often not the greatest. They oftentimes will reject it. They will just say, that sounds silly or that's not for me. You believe what you believe. I'm going to believe what I believe. But Paul writes to the church in Corinth. Now this church is not... Uh, it wouldn't be the ideal church. It wouldn't be the church that you would probably hang around in today. It wouldn't be the church that you would want to probably bring your family to if you're honest. There's lots of division within this church. There was also lots of lots of sin issues, like big sin issues, lots of leadership failures and leadership folly at the same time. And and yet Paul writes to this church because he loves the church and God loves this church and God wants them to do what's right. And as we get to verse 18, we're still in this introductory, uh, introductory chat, chapter. Um, and basically, he's addressing this issue of division within the church. And we get to verses, verse 18. And basically, there's, there's a misunderstanding that's taking place among the church on really what the power of God is, the folly, and the, and the misunderstanding that's causing division within the church. So let's take a, a read here in verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God... For since, excuse me, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demand sign and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, I believe that this, this section of scripture was written to be an encouragement to the church because wrapped up oftentimes in the middle of a, a local congregation is all the stuff that we bring with us in the doors of the church. It's all the stuff that we, we struggle with in life, all the stuff that we have been exposed to in life, all the things that we have, have uh, maybe before we got saved, um, learned and, and dealt with and, and processed in our, in our minds and what Paul begins with, he says, is the wisdom of God, the word of the cross, is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. There's an important statement there. You see, the, the, the outside world that doesn't know Christ looks at what we preach and what we believe as folly, as foolishness. But those of us who are saved and are continuing being delivered from our sin because of the cross and continue to be set free from the things that hold us back, those people, they look at the, the word of the cross and they say, no, 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 this is the power of God. This is the power of God. In fact, God said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will thwart the discernment of the discerning. 
He says, there are lots of people who out there are no doubt are intelligent, no doubt are smart. The gospel doesn't negate human intelligence. What it does do, though, is it looks at, at what we think is good, what we think is right, what we think is the best. And, we, and God simply says, no, 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 that's not it. You think you can be good enough. You think you can be wise enough. You think you can be discerning enough. But here's the problem. You're not. And that's why the cross, when you are preached uh, the truth of God because of the cross, here's the deal. You you think it's foolishness. And so Paul asks a series of rhetorical questions starting in verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? He says, where are all these people who are supposed to be the smartest and most intelligent and most educated of our society? Where are they? Where's this debater? Where's the scribe? Where's the wise one? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? You see, what, what God did in sending Jesus Christ, he took all ability of man to save themselves off the table. He says, look, you cannot save yourself. You are condemned before God. Your wisdom can't save you. Your knowledge can't save you. Your, your discernment can't save you. Whether or not you're a good debater can't save you. The only thing that can save you is what you have deemed foolish, and that is the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. And God has made made the, fool, the wisdom of the world look like foolishness because he took something that is impossible for man to do and made it so simple and so easy for us to just simply believe. For since the wisdom of the world, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through folly of what we preach to save those who believe. That's an amazing little chunk of scripture. You see, all throughout history, go back to the beginning, the knowledge of man. Where has that led us? The wisdom of man, where has that taken us? You see, what we need to know and understand is man's ways are not God's ways. What we think we are capable of is only a, a small portion of what God is capable of. And God says, look, you didn't seek me when, when you had opportunity to. You didn't seek me. When I was there, you didn't seek me. You didn't do anything. In fact, you went running after false gods. If you read Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and following, you get this idea that the man doesn't want God in all their wisdom. And so he says, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you something that sounds so ridiculous, that sounds so utterly impossible, that there is one person who hung on a cross, died and took the penalty for your sin, rose again in victory over sin and death on the third day. And he says, that's going to sound so foolish and so ridiculous in your human wisdom, but it is the one thing that you need more than anything. And what, what Paul is calling the church to do is let go of human wisdom and human reasoning. Let go of what you think you know and what you think you, you ought to know and what you think ought to save you. And he says, look to the truth of God's word. Yeah, to those who are perishing, it's foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. He says the Jews demand signs. Look at the life of Christ. Isn't that true? The Greeks seek wisdom. Look at Paul arguing with people on Mars Hill. You see, he says the Jews seek, demand signs. The Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. Gentiles look at it and say, that's impossible. The Jews can't accept Christ for who he is. And he says, but to those who are called, those who are invited, both Jews and Greeks, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. I love that last verse. For the foolishness of God. Now, what he's not saying is that God is foolish. What he is saying is simply this wonderful truth. That God... At his very foolish, which is not impossible, which is not a possible thing, would still be wiser than men. You see, God is more powerful than us. He is more knowing than us. He is more everything than us. And if we think about that for just a second, he says, the weakness of God is stronger than men. The foolishness of God, not saying that God is foolish, but saying that even at, at, at the lowest end of God's wisdom, it, it is still more wise than anything that we could ever know. And what he's saying is stop trying to figure this out in, in human terms. Stop trying to figure this out in a way that makes sense to you. Just look to the truth, listen to the truth, believe the truth, and trust God. Trust God. 
That's what the Bible is calling us to do this morning, to trust God, to look to God and say, you know, God, not my will, but yours. Not what I think is wise, but what you think is wise. Not what I think is right, but what you think is right. And I think that, that Paul wrote this as an encouragement as we look forward with the gospel, as we move forward with the gospel, as we think and pray for loved ones, that they may think this is foolish. They may think this is folly. They may think this is pointless, but it's the truth that they need to hear. And they need to hear it because hell is real. Hell is real. Eternity is real. And we hold the truth in our hands this morning. Be encouraged by that, church. Be encouraged by that as we go forward with the gospel that even though they may think it's foolishness, let me just tell you what. In the eyes of God, it is exactly what they need. Thank you guys for watching. We hope you guys have a great day. Take care, God bless, and we'll see you tomorrow. If you guys want any more information, visit the link below, nippiganbaptist.com. All sorts of great things there. You can also register for Sunday morning church at 10 a.m. and uh, Wednesday evening Bible study at 6.30. Take care, guys. God bless.